All right, thank you. Um, what I'm going to talk today about is linear optics and how it relates to AI fabric scale up and to scale out. And my agenda is, um, it wanders around a little bit, it's kind of thematic, but um, I hope to kind of give some emphasis to some of the things that some of the previous speakers spoke about. First of all, I'm going to talk about linear pluggable optics. One question that comes up is where is it? Why aren't people deploying it? Why, where, we've heard about this for a while, where is it? And um, what I'm going to explain is, is what I think is the way that LPO is actually first going to enter the market and how that market will evolve. Then I get to the whole subject of CPO, NPO, LPO. And uh, the good news is they're all linear, but um, for AI fabric scale up and scale out, there are really a lot of options. There's really a continuum of options, a continuum of design space that I think really has to be considered. And at this point, really everything is on the table. And the design space is somewhat larger than I think people realize. And it's only constrained by, um, you know, a, um, a commitment to you know, previous paradigms. Um, and some of these paradigms are breaking. So I will talk about some of those weakening paradigms. Okay, first of all, what is linear pluggable optics? Um, well, it's, in, in these diagrams, it's just simply a, a matter of removing DSPs. And that sounds very simple. And it is very simple-minded. In fact, it was so simple-minded, there was a huge amount of objection to people that it would, would ever work when, when one did this. But surprisingly, and it was a surprise to even me, uh, to me, when, when people started doing this, they could actually make it work. And um, you know, OFC uh, 2023 was kind of like the birthplace because I know a lot of people had never heard about LPO going in and they went out having heard about LPO and you know, it, came, it, came out of, um, it came out of nowhere. So I think at that point it was realized that people, you could close this link without the DSPs and using suitably advanced DSPs on the, on the far ends, but uh, could it be manufactured? Was it workable? Did it have to be fine tuned? You know, what, what would have to happen to, um, to really get it to market? And I'm going to propose um, that the first mover for linear pluggable optics is going to be putting LPO in the NIC only. So here is a diagram where um, you know I've I've only put the LPO in the NICs, and I've got them connected to either Tomahawk 5 or Tomahawk 4 switch. Those switches have DSPs in them. The fact that I have a DSP retimer at every port means that every port looks the same. And you know, one of the big questions about you know, switches is, well, I've got all those different traces, they're all gonna be different. But by putting DSPs there, I've made everything look the same. I've compressed my, um, uh, the amount of testing that I have to do to, um, to, to make this happen. So I wanna say one thing is that the, the NIC is, um, it's a very simple system. It's got a very short electrical channel uh, to, the, to the DSP. It's um, very repeatable. I don't have to worry about different, uh, different channels. And in, in some DSPs, for example, uh, in, the LP, in the LPO world, everybody knows about the, the, um, the Tomahawk 5 and it's DSP based CERTES. Well, it's the same one that's actually in the, to in the Thor 2 NIC, also made by, uh, by Broadcom. Um, and then the other thing that I don't think people realize is that just putting LPO in the NIC is a bigger win than LPO at the switch. Um, you know, at Dell, we make um, servers and we've made them for a long time. And, you know, we're actually several generations in to liquid cooling at the server side. We are zero generations into looking at liquid cooling at the switch side. I mean, we're starting to think about it, but, you know, we're not nearly as, um, as developed on that side because the, the need just isn't as extreme as it is on the server side. And it's just getting more extreme with the, um, these high power <laughs> dissipation compute elements. 
And finally, to make this all work, um, the system vendor, I think you really need a system vendor to ensure the whole DSP to DSP link by selling a bundled system. I don't, I, I am, um, I'm not confident that you're gonna be able to mix and match these things, at least not in the, um, in the near future. Um, the next mover after that would be to put the LPO in the top of rack switch and the NIC. And again, um, you know, the system vendor would ensure the DSP to DSP link by bundling, you know, the switch, the NIC, the optics, and, um, and, and so forth. And then I'll put something controversial here. I'd say standards alone may not be enough for overall system optimization. Why would that be? We love standards. Um, you know, this DSP just isn't, never comes up in the standards because none of the people that make them tell us how they work. So they're the most important part, yet they're not standardized. I don't know. That seems interesting, at least. Okay, weakening paradigms. So a lot of uh, time, so, so I work at, at a system company, you know, we're not, we're, we're kind of the near to the end users and all we've heard about or the people that I work with have heard about is whether it's CPO, NPO, or LPO and it's kind of like, well, which one is, um, you know, up today, which one is down? And what I'm gonna say is that um, this seems to be the wrong question. The solution space really forms a continuum and if you just even look at these diagrams, I mean, you can, rewire these diagrams. There's so many different ways you can put those together. There are so many different permutations and combinations. It really does form a continuum. You know, there's um, half retimed, retimed, non-retimed. Um, you know, you might say, well, the pluggable, non-pluggable has to be a, a sharp line. And, and I actually think that, that forms a continuum. And I think people really have to think out of the box because there's a lot of different ways that you can put these things together extremely effectively that just doesn't fit into the way that people think about switches and so forth. So the industry focus, I mean, if you go to the, um, I mean, I feel bad because when I go to IEEE Ethernet, I'm a NIC guy from a NIC company or a server company, and all they talk about are switches. And that's what they base all their standards on. But you know, there are other devices out there, and now at least people know there are GPUs. GPUs are not switches. They have different kind of, they have, you know, different properties and different needs, and we need to be satisfying those needs. So, um, LPO in the NIC, is that really even LPO? I could actually also call that, um, I, I, I could actually, instead of calling that LPO, I could call that a pluggable NPO, because it is so close. Additionally, I could say, is a NIC or a GPU, is that really a near faceplate DSP-based certies just looking for a pluggable NPO? I mean, there are different ways of looking at these things, and I think we have to expand our vision, and, uh, uh, you know, there, there's a lot of opportunity. So I want to give some other examples. Um, this is an example of an AI um, fabric scale-up. And my example just uses, you know, these, these rail topologies. And wow, look at that. That is a mess. Imagine having to wire all those things. Those are eight rows of servers, um, shelves, eight, eight NICs in each shelf. Every NIC's got to go to a different switch and so forth. Um, that's hard to do. So the way that we used to build networks and even think about building networks is to build it one cable at a time. I connect here, this port to that port. Sometimes I do this like every week for 52 weeks because I'm expanding my network. Well, with these fabrics, they're really built all at one time. So there are companies um, like Corning or you know, other companies that actually handle all of that fiber management and they, they give you this harness that will drop all the right connectors at all the right lengths, so they're right in front of your, uh, right in front of where your switches or NICs or GPUs are, um, and really, that's changed the way that we think about building networks. And and I want I want to point out that this shuffle, which is all of this management, figuring out how to get one thing to the other place, where 
you would not be able to send a technician and give them a wiring diagram and do it one at a time. This is the un, unsung hero of, uh, of AI fabrics, is really the shuffle, and it's, it's actually not that complicated. But after you do the shuffle, you have to do this other thing. Um, you know, you might have a 64 port switch. You might want to send half of the ports to the, um, you know, towards the GPUs. Well, that means I've got 32 transmitters per each switch. And it's like, why am I, why do I have all this cable out here? What are these, what are these um, pluggable transceivers buying me? You know, I would really like just one pipe to, uh, to plug in. I mean, that's a paradigm that we've had for so long that a switch is something that has a lot of different uh, receptacles at different, at different distances, and that's driven a lot of the way that we think about things, even <laughs> the way that we think about um, onboard optics and near-packaged optics and co-packaged optics. So um, weakening paradigms, uh, segmenting bandwidth into eight-lane physical ports doesn't really seem to make sense anymore. Um, you know, I, I know that the uh, IEEE spends a lot of time on max speed, but nobody cares about that anymore. If it's that it's you have can have a 1.6 T max speed, because no one's you you know everyone is just utilizing these um, wants to utilize these uh, lanes separately. They, each lane wants to have its own life. Um, you know, does it make sense that we've been using the same kind of pluggable modules for? Um, both um, copper and optics. It actually um, has come at a very big cost. Um, the copper could have been much cheaper if we, you know, had it did did things separately. It's kind of amazing when you when you really look at it. And do pluggable modules make sense? And should they be have more lanes? 32, 64, 128, 256. One pluggable module. One module for the whole. Switch. You could say, well, that, oh, that's just CPO. Well, okay, CPO is kind of like one optic for the whole switch, but why did you put it in the most difficult place you could possibly put it with the strictest requirements, that is, to co package it with an ASIC? I mean, that just puts so many constraints on you that it, um, it the mind, it boggles the mind, boggles at least my mind, which is small. Um, so summary, LPOs, um, they're going to show up first in, um, in NICs and they'll move from there. It's going to be very important that the system vendors provide the validation of the end-to-end -end link all the way from, from one, from one uh, CERTES, DSP-based CERTES to the other with the optics in between. Um, you know, there's a continuum of options in this uh, space of uh, possibilities. And if you look at what people want to do up on scale up and scale out, there are, I mean, NVIDIA has already stepped far outside the box and everyone is going to be going pretty far outside the box compared to where we are now to come up with the optimal solutions. Um, and then there are weakable, weak, weakening paradigms, the whole paradigm of what is CPO, what is a pluggable, I think those are, um, those are, um, those are weakening. Um, the paradigm of having, you know, these pipes at, you know, eight lanes or even 16 lanes, that just doesn't seem right. Um, something else is needed. Uh, these face plates and with these high number of receptacles for high rate of switches don't seem to make sense. <sighs> Geometrical constraints don't seem to make sense. I mean, we have 19 inch racks, we have 22 inch racks. Why? I don't know, we have RUs that are, I mean, we, we, we have so many um, legacies that we just kind of uh, unconsciously accept that, you know, there, there really are a number of other ways to do it. And I'm sure that I've only listed a few and others can probably think of, um, of more. So I think that is all I have to say before the break. Thank you. Thank you, David. Ali. Hi, David. I think what you're saying actually uh, regarding uh, NICT uh, to be the first, you know, stepping stone for LPO, I think makes a lot of sense. Thank uh, you. My recommendation is uh, just don't make the, the loss of the NIC too low, you know? Make yeah, it, yes, you know, there maybe are. Uh, like a 9, 10 dB might be, the, might be a good place to be, but I think it makes a lot of sense, yeah. 
physically, um, uh, um, yes, the, the loss should, should not be as low as possible, yeah. but you probably want it as near as possible, so there might be right. padding, as we used to say in the right, right. RF world. Uh, and I do also agree that in some of the, uh, like a GPU where you have only few cores, it doesn't look that different than a NIC. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think that's a very good uh, point. I think it makes, makes a lot of sense. Thank you. Thanks, Ali. I was expecting. <laughs> Oh, oh, now, oh, oh, now it comes. I'm pragmatic, you know. If, if, you know, I think what you had made, made a lot of sense. Okay. Yeah, and, and I, that's what I've been saying for some time. Thank you. David, are, is your uh, slant or are you presenting the case that something that's uh, on board uh, saves that step of having to deal with the plug, uh, the electrical contact for the plug, the handling of the plug? Uh, so so th the, the handling of the plug, I mean, uh, some people think that's extremely valuable. Some people don't. I mean, uh, that, that's why I do think there are things in between having plugs and having onboard and having, you know, pin uh, socketed um, optics. And I think the way that we think of a module, I mean, there might be one big module for a switch or five big modules. I mean, there might be a different number and they might plug in from the top instead of from the front. I mean, there's, there's lots of, you know, we, we shouldn't let today's geometry be a constraint. And, you know, y if you think about things long enough, you can realize that, wow, you can kind of change space and move geometry by the, ra the way that you arrange things. So you can actually bend space. For those uh, larger options with more lanes, isn't that more realizable with a onboard versus a pluggable? I don't know. That, that's, that, that's an excellent question. I mean, one of the things that we found out, or that I found out over the last few years that is surprising, is, um, you know, I, I, I thought at one time, oh, we gotta make that copper as short as possible. There's no possible way to, um, you know, we, we gotta get it right up there as, as, as narrow. But Peter showed 25 dB. Uh, there, there's, there's space to move the optics away from the, um, away from the ASIC without a huge um, penalty in terms of uh, power or performance. So there's room, there's, th there's room that I, I wouldn't have anticipated, you know, uh, three years ago. Thank you. That's why I say the design space is, uh, is kind of huge. It's almost overwhelming. Any other questions? If not, Thank you, David. Thank you.